go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, all. Welcome back to another episode of the virtual speaker series. Um, today, we're going to be discussing, is it an idea or an opportunity? Um, a lot of the times you may come across uh, a thought process where you say, hey, this is a great idea, but it doesn't necessarily translate into a great business opportunity. So today we've got two amazing experts that are going to be kind of going through and discussing um, the difference between an idea and opportunity and how to kind of differentiate um, and decide between the two. Um, first up, Miss Allison Cater uh, has actually been with us before. And if you'll just introduce yourself, uh, where you work, and one fun fact about yourself, Allison. Sure. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm Allison. I live in Boston. Um, I am a buyer, uh, so working for an online company, Rulala and Guild.com. I'm actually transitioning into an e comm position, uh, managing a website, so that'll be a new transition for me. But a uh, fun fact is that um, I just started gardening for the first time, so it's actually really fun for me. But um, so growing a lot of tomatoes and zucchinis and cucumbers and everything, and green beans, and they're all starting to blossom. So it's been an interesting experience because usually I kill every plant. So um, it's a lot of fun if that's something you guys want to start a little pod for the for the springtime. Uh, highly recommend it. Awesome. Yeah, we're uh, in South Florida. Well. I some of us come from like Caribbean backgrounds. So my parents have like mango trees and all kinds of trees in the backyard. It's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a real thing. It is a real yeah. thing. Um, yeah. My parents are actually in South Florida too. So they're always sending pictures of their mango trees and avocados. So <laughs> little bells up here. I can't get the same things, but sorry. Perfect. Tell them that if their trees are blossoming right now, I'm coming over for some mangoes. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then Kevin. Kevin is actually joining us from the left coast this morning, so a little bit earlier, but fortunately he's an early bird. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do and then fun fact about yourself. Yeah, uh, great to meet everyone. Uh, this is my first time doing this. Um, so I am a venture capitalist. Um, so if you've ever seen the show Shark Tank, that's, that's what I do for a living. Um, Coincidentally, similar to Allison, focused on retail uh, as well as media. Um, been in venture capital and investing for the last six years or so. Um, and then before that, had a company of my own focused on custom clothing. Um, uh, fun fact about myself is I'm currently training for what's called a century. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a cycling term, uh, meaning doing 100 miles uh, round trip in, in one route. Um, so right now I'm doing about 55. I'm hoping to get 100 by the end of next month. Whoa. I feel like that we could do an entire discussion just about that, but we're not <laughs> going to uh, diverge too much from the path today. So um, we'll, you know, kind of get started a little bit. Um, talking about an idea versus a opportunity, right? Um, but before we get into that, talk to us a little bit more, Kevin, about your professional role as a venture capitalist. Um, what does that kind of entail? And is this something that you kind of envisioned yourself doing when you were in high school or junior high, like a lot of our students are today? Uh, yeah. Um, so my role as, a, uh, as an investor is, is primarily to meet with different entrepreneurs, different startups, um, assess their product, um, assess the market, um, create a, a pretty lengthy report, it's usually 20 to 25 pages, um, work with our team, and then usually invest anywhere from as low as $100,000 um, to $2.5 million. Um, been fortunate, backed some founders that some people here might know. Um, for example, a company called Honey. Um, they were acquired by PayPal recently for $4 billion. Um, there's another company called Notum that sells cashmere clothing. Um, Madison Reed, they do hair coloring. Um, and several others. Um, did I ever uh, envision becoming in this role? No. Um, uh, so I, I actually um, wanted to work for the FBI in high school. I wanted to be a forensic accountant. Um, I was watching uh, the show called The White Collar, 
uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, and I was obsessed with this character uh, named Neil Caffrey, who was like a criminal, and then like, uh, uh, and then he uh, becomes an FBI agent, uh, and I was obsessed with that. So I actually went to school for finance and took forensic accounting courses, and just realized it wasn't for me, um, and rather actually entrepreneurship was for me. Um, that's why I resonated with this group and this audience. Awesome. Well, that's a, a heck of an origin story, if you will. Um, thank you very much, man, because I don't think you would have been as much value to some of the students as a forensic accountant. So um, you're in the right place. You are in the right place. Uh, Allison, so you are a buyer. Um, what does that entail, right? And then what are some of the challenges that make what you do different for a online e-commerce uh, platform than, let's say, a physical location? Yeah, so um, as a buyer, I am, and for retail, when you walk into a store and you see clothing on a shelf, there is somebody behind the scenes that is actually planning that inventory, putting those clothes logistically to get to that store, and um, really planning your assort the assortment out. So a vendor um, could be your line if you're creating something, um, would come to me and say, hey, I have this great clothing line. I want to sell it in your stores. What do you think? We would work together. And essentially, I would, um, you know, a lot of times in a buy as a buyer, I'm presenting to my senior manager, to my CEO, to the president of the company, the board saying, here's what I think the assortment's going to look like for the season, and here's what we need to buy and invest in. So, um, you know, interesting concept, sort of you have to be an entrepreneur in a position as a buyer because I'm also not just buying product, but I'm selling it to my business um, to make sure I can get the money from them. Um, the e-com space has been different. It's evolved a lot in over the last few years, especially with Amazon. So a lot of times because of technology, um, I'm able to react very quickly. So when we walk into um, a Macy's, for instance, right? They're, they've already set up what the assortment's going to look like for next spring. They have already bought it. They know what it looks like. It's going to go into stores, and then they can't react to that until after the sales have come through. Whereas on e-com, I can make the internet doesn't sleep. So I could, tomorrow I can make a decision based on the sales of today, and I can change what that looks like. I can change what you see on sites, how I present um, products to you. So it's actually a lot more um, data analytics, which is really exciting. Um, and a different viewpoint of its same business model, but just a different viewpoint. So it's been very interesting to see that transition. I love that. And, and it, it's interesting what you said about data analytics, because a lot of the times, um, one of the questions we ask sometimes is, um, what was your favorite and your least favorite uh, subject in high school? And I think we asked that the last time. And a lot of people reply math and then find themselves in positions where math is so critical to the work that they do. Yeah, and, and it's interesting. There's a science to the math when you're in data analytics too. So creating the other hypothesis and what are you looking for and, and pulling and curating data, um, it, you know, it's becoming more of an everyday need in business um, just to be able to set a platform and, and create growth opportunities. Awesome. And can you tell us a little bit, because often we, we, we talk about everything glamorous about business and, and all of the great parts. So we, we want to give you an opportunity to talk about that, right? So can you talk about one of your wins, but also share with us um, a loss that you've had professionally and the lesson you learned from that? Yeah. Um, so I think... Um, you know, my career has been a little bit varied from brick and mortar to e-com. And I think one of the things that I found valuable and, and have learned um, really through making assumptions is that you always have to ask questions and can't assume that every business is run the same, even within a business uh, or in, within a corporation. So I used to work for Ross Stores, which is, um, if you're not familiar with it, it's like TJ Maxx. Um, here in the upper, in the East Coast, we don't have it. So you guys might be more familiar, but um, at Ross, I bought and managed candles and home fragrance. And at the time, it was in the division of uh, beauty and fragrance, um, which didn't quite make sense to the business model. So a year into me owning the business, myself and the business structure was moved into the home division. So even though we're still under Ross as, a, as the total company, 
um, the business just moved into different divisions. And so I kept moving along, kind of assuming that we were doing the same reporting, same business structure, same analytics. Um, and it came time to present a line and it wasn't exactly the same way that the, our VP had wanted to see everything. Um, and so it really was, you know, one, I had to do the work again <laughs> in a different way, but it was a great learning just to understand, okay, you can assume, even if you're in the same company, that everything is going to be the same. Um, to always ask questions, be humble. It's, there's always a learning experience. Um, I think me transitioning into a new role too, same thing. I can't assume everything's run or looked at the same way. You always have to be willing to grow and learn. Um, and just asking questions is super important. Um, from, yeah, and just from a win from that same, same, same business. So taking those learnings, making sure that I was doing, um, you know, the right thing by asking the right questions, making sure I was talking to the right amount of people. Uh, I built out a full fall line, um, which was all of the Christmas candles and the Thanksgiving candles and home fragrance. Um, built a strategy around that and developed it and put together, made sure that I knew what I was putting together, but also what was expected of me um, and had really um, positive feedback from our president of the company just saying like, this is what we're looking for. It shows that there's a strategy and a growth opportunity. Um, and so I was, you know, it's, it's taking those learnings, making sure you're asking the right questions and then using that to really continue to grow in your efforts. Awesome. Lifelong love of learning is probably one of the most important skills that was not stressed enough when I was up. So um, always something you can use. Kevin, uh, in your experience, you know, what, what has been a, a huge win that you can point to, but then also a loss that you took and a lesson that you learned from that? Yeah. Um, the wins for me, I feel like are mostly just luck. Uh, <laughs> like 10% skill, 90% luck. Um, so, uh, the, the quick win for me, um, was, was life changing was, was, was a company called honey. I think I mentioned them a few minutes ago. Um, I think the interesting story about honey, um, is so for those who don't know what honey does, it's a, it's a Google Chrome add on, um, that you automatically get dis discounts when you buy something online. So if you were to go to, I don't know, uh, walmart.com and try to buy something and you'd, you'd press the honey button and get an immediate coupon. Um, so the interesting story about Honey um, was that they got declined from every venture capitalist they met, um, or almost everyone. Um, so they were two founders, not from well-known schools or anything that you'd expect. Um, they didn't have the typical kind of Silicon Valley background. Uh, and I think that's why they did so well, uh, because they identified a problem and kind of to the topic of here, they identified an opportunity that others didn't see and didn't make sense. Um, so they took advantage of that. They went against kind of the normal grain. Um, they were able to get a little bit of funding, um, luckily from us and some other people. Uh, but more importantly, they executed um, their business really well um, and ended up getting acquired by PayPal for $4 billion. Um, wow. Um, which is, and you know, at the end of when they exited, um, these founders went from uh, people that could barely afford uh, to have food on the table for their kids to billionaires, um, like almost it, it overnight. So that was just an incredible experience to just be on the sidelines and watch that um, and, and really kind of evolve my kind of understanding. Um, the biggest failure, there's, there's, there's a lot, especially in this field. It's like for every honey you get, you get 10 that uh, failed uh, and you have like a, a crying moment for sure. Um, for for me, the most recent one um, was an understanding was an investing in a company that um, that had all the classic check marks. So it was like the anti honey. It had the Silicon Valley founders from Google, etc. Um, it had all the big name investors joining. Um, it seemed like it was a company that was going to do really well. Um, and that really blinded me. In, in our industry, we call it FOMO, um, fear of missing out. Um, and oftentimes when you see all these like positive factors, you assume this is gonna be a great opportunity. Um, so I definitely let my guard down in terms of assessing the opportunity, ended up investing. And then um, the company immediately went under. It went under in six months um, wow. because I didn't pay attention to the things I should have, which is like the financials, um, the actual viability of the opportunity, the cost, et cetera. 
Um, so that, that happens a lot and it's a reality check every time. Wow. So what you're basically saying is that even the experts sometimes don't get it right. Oh yeah. We're human. <laughs> so when talking about that, right, when looking at a, a company coming in um, and they have this great idea, um, how do you define an idea? How do you define an opportunity? And how do you tell the difference between the two? Yeah. Um, so for me, an idea uh, comes all throughout, right? Like, and I, one has an idea throughout the day. Uh, and consciously or unconsciously, that's stemming from an opportunity that one is seeing. So for me, the, the opportunity is first. Um, you know, it can be something as small as um, I wish my dishwasher would clean dishes better um, or like I wish my clothes wouldn't come off the hanger. Um, so you put a little Velcro piece um, and then you come up with an idea, which is that Velcro piece or maybe a better dishwashing cleaner or something like that. Um, I think the difference in when you make an opportunity into an idea and then into a product is assessing if that opportunity is worth your time uh, and if that product will really resolve not only your problem, but a lot of people's problems. Awesome. Um, Allison, uh, same thing, right? Uh, is there a difference between an idea and an opportunity the way you would define it? And what is that difference? So I probably have a different interesting take on this just because, um, so in retail and in fashion, you, a lot of ideas really are trends for us. And so, you know, you could have a lot of different trends that you see in the marketplace. Is it, uh, for instance, tie dye, which is a big trend right now, are these ideas that um, you know, and concepts that we really want to have in our assortment and our line, but is that actually, an, are these ideas actually opportunities? So for us, when we look at it is what is that bigger picture of these, this idea? Um, is it everything that goes into a store, it needs to make money. So we want to see, is there a return on this product? And so are these idea trends, um, opportunities to turn sales profit, um, and, and grow the business. And so I think um, just from my perspective and uh, looking at it from a retail, uh, like a store side, we really want to see, do these ideas really grow into these bigger opportunities? So um, a little, I guess a little bit different take on that, but um, you know, for us, it's a lot of trends essentially is what we're looking at. And so there's an interesting, right? Because I think your, your, you, the difference in your answers is also because of the difference in your perspectives in a little, right, in a, in a lot of ways. Um, for somebody just starting a business, right, so somebody comes in to you, I have this business idea slash opportunity, um, how do they clearly state their idea or opportunity to the market? So you would be the market for somebody who's starting a clothing company um, and wants to get it featured in retail. How would they still, how do they communicate that to you? Yeah, I think, um, I think coming to a buyer with your ideas, it has to be presented as an opportunity because I want to see that you see this as a long-term um, goal and that's something that not just makes money for you, but makes money for me. Um, and for my business. And so presenting, what does the marketplace look like? What do you see? Does you, is your idea valid in the space? Or maybe it's something new and it's a niche market, um, you know, or a void in the marketplace that you want to bring to me and here's why. But I think a lot of this is knowing what the opportunity is of the growth and the, the, the longevity of it. Um, and sometimes trends are really just a seasonal piece, right? It could just mean it's for three months. Um, but where do you see that in the marketplace? How do you fit? So I sort of, you know, when, when I have retailers come to me, I really need, or vendors come to me, I really need them to show me the marketplace, show me where their space is valid um, and what the opportunities are because nobody just wants to throw something at the wall and hope it works. So you have to kind of look at the big picture of that. And that's where the numbers and the analytics, the, the, the boring stuff, not, not the stuff that sounds sexy on paper, but the, the real work has to be done to kind of look at that and 
take that guess and educated guess as to whether or not it's a good bet, if you will. Yeah. Zen. Yeah. Um, for you, Kevin, you know, you 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 hear pitches all the time. Like you probably hear pitches in your sleep at this point. How what, what separates <laughs> somebody who can articulate their opportunity from somebody who is still not clear about what it is that they're offering. Yeah, um, it's a simple framework uh, and, and something that I've learned over time. If you cannot explain what you do to your grandmother, uh, then it's very difficult to explain to anyone else, right? Like um, no matter how high level and high technical your product could be, uh, it's hopefully solving something that's relatively simple and something that you can explain in, in, in a few sentences. Um, so, and I think that the importance of that, and especially to this group, that might be a bunch of budding CEOs, um, is that sometimes we get in the weeds of our own business. Um, and we emphasize this problem so much that it becomes our lives, but you have to empathize with the person that you're speaking to um, or the customer that you're speaking to, because this might be a small problem for them, might not even be a problem for them. Um, so how do you understand where they're coming from and then change your messaging um, to fit how, like what, what they're going through? That's huge, right? Uh, articulation of value. What is the value that you bring to the marketplace? Is there a big enough marketplace for what it is that you do? Um, what are what would you say is the best way for a budding CEO entrepreneur to create an idea or opportunity? The best um, the best way uh, to create an idea or an opportunity. Um, I think it's it's all right, if you face a personal problem, um, talk to your friends, talk to people who may also be facing that problem. Uh, and come up with the smallest startup you could possibly come up with. Um, so not like when you start out, you don't need to think gigantic. You don't need to, oh, I need a staff of 25 people. I need to build out this amazing software application. It could just be something that you build that day. Uh, and does that small thing help fix that problem? If not, um, or if it kind of does, then maybe you're onto something. Um, this is called like the lean startup methodology. Um, uh, it's a great book if, if any of you ever want to read it. Um, it helps you kind of think of the framework of how you want to develop features and how you want to spend your time on developing a business. Because sometimes you might over engineer something uh, and make it over complex for a market that doesn't really want it. I like the fact that you said that because it always reminds me of the story of Instagram, right? Like they, they go to Facebook, they try to get a job at Facebook. Facebook doesn't hire them. They create this app that does everything for photos. Nobody wants it. And they scale it down to just share photos and get acquired for billions of dollars from, from by the same company that didn't want to hire them to work for them. Right? So in, instead of a hundred thousand dollar a year job, you now are a billionaire off of this idea that you really scaled down because every time you went back to the marketplace, they said that's nice, but we don't really need that. And so that's always interesting. Uh, for you, Allison, your take is probably a little different, right? As far as um, people being able to identify or create an idea of, or opportunity, what are some of the things that you see when people come in to pitch their concepts to you? Yeah. Um, so I think, I think I agree, like having a framework and your, it's almost like making your idea as simplistic as possible um, when it's being pitched because at, from a consumer point of view, um, consumers, a lot of people, they just want to read, right? So when we, when we are marketing or pitching products in stores, you don't want to look at all the verbiage. You want to see the pretty item, you want to buy it, you want to go, right? But there might be some really cool aspects to it. Uh, for instance, maybe it's a, uh, a t-shirt that has sun protection, like UV protection in it, in the fabrication, and it has insect repellent. And I say this because they're the company that I'll be working for, uh, that's what they do, which is really interesting. But how do you tell that message and how do you tell that story and 
and, and again, no one wants to really read the fine print of it all. So how simplistic can you possibly make it? Um, they found a void in the marketplace. It's a niche market. It's, there's a need for it, but how do you grow that opportunity? Um, so I think, I, you know, I think again, if you just take your business idea, make it simple, grow it and build it from there, but really just having the framework and the steps and maybe you can, it's like, you know, in science, you make a hypothesis and then you start going right off of that. Like, here's another idea, here's another idea, here's another thought and kind of building through that. But like Kevin said too, talking to as many people as you know, um, having those conversations, there is no siloed effect at siloed conversation. You kind of have to have many different perspectives um, because who knows what the person on the other side is going to say back to you. So kind of making sure you have all those angles are really important. That is very important and, and feedback. And uh, you said something important, not one of the questions, but I really wanted to kind of dig a little bit deeper because you spoke about the need to kind of get feedback, but then also to kind of change direction based on the feedback, which is something we call a pivot. Um, how important is it for companies to know when to pivot and how to pivot? Oh gosh, it's so important. <laughs> so I think, um, and again, maybe from a different perspective too, just being in retail, things change, trends change quickly. You can see in a second how somebody saying, let's get off of Facebook, then a hundred people do it, right? So what, I think the idea that things can happen so quickly, you have to be able to change, you have to be able to pivot in that moment, and especially in the online e-commerce world. It's so important because when the internet doesn't sleep, people are constantly on it. Something can happen in a split second and you have to be reactionary to that. Um, and again, within reason, making sure you, you are looking at it collectively, your, the issues at hand as a whole and having as much feedback onto that. Um, one of the things in, in retail that e-commerce space that I've dealt with is a trend may change in a day. So how can you use that same, and you may own that product, right? So how do you keep that same product and tell a different story? Um, and so for instance, we could have, I, I could have um, a group of products that are all tie dye and maybe tie dye is no longer a trend. Um, and so maybe I pull those pieces out and I'm going to show that as a sale messaging instead, or maybe it's um, you know showing it as these are really cool tops along with a bunch of other products. So you still see it, but it's not the focus. So there's different perspectives, different ways to look at the same product. I think that's important too. Um, but you know you have to pivot, you have to change your point of view, and maybe it's again the same product, but you just look at it in a different way. That's an amazing answer, um, Kevin. When we talk about that, right, you see it all the time from founders and, and, and CEOs coming in, they want the money. Um, how important is it to know how and when to pivot? Yeah, um, this actually reminds me of something that happened yesterday. Um, so I would say uh, the pivot is actually the hardest time when things are going well. Um, so if your business is doing well right now, um, you wouldn't even fathom thinking about changing the direction. Uh, but oftentimes that's probably when, if at all necessary, um, when you're pivoting, when, when, the, when the business is at a decline or near bankruptcy, that's probably not the best time. Um, at least from an investor angle, because it's really hard to rebuild at that, at that stage versus when you're doing well, you have capital, you have people that believe in you and you can switch. So the, the story that I was saying from yesterday was, um, we're investors in a company um, that primarily focused on selling goods, so selling like snack bars, et cetera, in the vehicle, um, in rideshare vehicles. Um, you might have seen it in your Uber or Lyft, it's called Cargo. Um, um, so Cargo was doing exceptionally well. Um, they uh, were every year, it was over 200% year over year growth. Um, their team went from 10 people to over 50 people. Um, they got a huge new office, et cetera, um, and they were already becoming profitable. Um, but then the CEO decided, um, after really assessing the market, was that um, even though our business is doing well, um, we have a much bigger opportunity, uh, and we have a unique advantage by having a direct partnership with Uber um, to actually change their business to over-the-vehicle advertisement, so more or less a TV screen on top of the car. Um, 
and to our heads, that doesn't sound that cool. Um, but uh, when he did the economics of it uh, and priced it out, he realized that that was a much bigger opportunity for cargo uh, than was selling goods in the vehicle. So he decided to suspend the whole business. He had to lay off, unfortunately, about 50% of the staff. Um, he sold the office and he completely uh, leaned down the team to entirely change the business. Again, this is when they're doing really well as a company um, and decide to completely change. So to the question of uh, when does a pivot matter and how you should assess it um, is knowing what your consumer wants, but also knowing what is a big opportunity that you think your team is uniquely positioned for uh, and always keeping your eye or ears on the consumer because they change all the time. For example, um, to Allison's business, if you're in the fashion world, I don't think wearing a suit right now or buying suits <laughs> makes a lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, if I'm in the suit business, am I going to change my business? Maybe I'm going to become loungewear now um, or offer more formal but comfortable t-shirts, whatever it may be. I love that you ended with that because just yesterday I read an article that said Brooke Brothers, which is a 200 year old company, has filed for bankruptcy protection specifically for that reason, right? The, the, the market has changed. Nobody's wearing suits anymore. So that, that's, that's their business model. Nobody's wearing that enough of that for them to stay profitable. Um, and they've really kind of seen that affect their business. So that's important that you kind of hit on that. And, and also to touch on that too, to what Kim's saying, they, they haven't been listening to the customer for a while. So even pre-COVID, you know, the suits, the casual started becoming a thing. So did their shirts become more casual? Not necessarily. The suits for um, men's suiting actually changed fits, right? Less boxy, more fitted, skinnier pants, things like that. Um, and they weren't really evolving. And it doesn't mean you have to change your whole DNA, but it's about sort of extending out from where your comfort zone is and finding those other pieces of the marketplace that you can play in and still keep your DNA of, of your suits and your, your fitted wear. But, um, you know, I think, again, not listening to the, the customer or what the trends are and kind of just being able to pivot, um, we you now see how that's affected their business. So even the experts, even 200 year old experts still get it wrong if they don't learn how to also remain flexible and nimble, depending on what the market is doing. And that that's really a very important kind of, like I'm a business nerd, so I, I follow all of this stuff, but I think it's something that if you are not paying attention, it's easy to just gloss over and not take the lesson from, from, from this situation. Um, when talking about ideas and, and opportunities, a lot of the times, especially with young people and, and our students, um, they have all of these different ideas, right? So should, would you recommend that a, a business starting out should have multiple ideas or opportunities, or should they focus on one first and then kind of grow as, as they're successful? Um, Allison, what would you recommend? Hmm, that's an interesting question. Um having not started a business, uh, but just owning really specific businesses, um, I think it really depends on what your market is and where your, your business lies. And I, I think Kevin might have a different um, perspective on this too, just seeing other businesses come to, to him. But um, you know, in the retail sector, uh, an example to give is uh, lately, I think you guys may have heard about this, but over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of tariffs that have been added to products coming in from China. Um, and one of the industries that has been really hurt are lighting, the lighting industry. So lamps, um, any sort of light bulbs, lights, things like that. Um, there's a lot of companies that only specifically um, do lighting. That's all they do. That's their whole business. And the tariffs were, I think, over... Um, over time uh, accumulated, it was like over 60% increase to their costs, which is huge. And do they take some of that cost increase to the consumers? How did they, how are they able to play in the marketplace? Um, and it put a lot of companies out of business because they did, they had nothing else to kind of um, share that margin drain with. So for instance, 
another company could have, they could sell lighting, but they could also sell furniture, they could sell mirrors, they could sell other products that didn't take those hits and sort of balance out their profit margins. Um, but, you know, as a company that's just focused on lighting, they weren't able to survive um, something such as a tariff. So I think it kind of depends on, on what the idea or opportunity is that you're working on, but uh, from a just a retail perspective, sometimes that can be really hurtful, just having one, one product. That one's interesting too, because I think so much changed so quickly when these tariffs were put on. Um, there are a lot of people whose business structures and their business model was so dependent on importing goods that they couldn't, they couldn't adapt because they, their, their margins were already so thin. They were already so small that they just couldn't make that pivot and that right. adaptation to the new situations. Uh, for you, Kevin, yeah. how do you feel about the question of multiple ideas versus focus on just one? Um, it's interesting because, because there's successful case studies for both. Um, but I'm not going to be political about it. Uh, in, in my, in my head, um, uh, it's, it's removing emotion to some extent, um, out of your evaluation of success. Um, so I would personally, even though you have multiple ideas, like even I have an idea book that will be right next to me, um, where I'll come up with different ideas during the day and I'll write it down. Um, and, uh, it's taking, assessing those ideas and saying, what am I uniquely positioned to do well at? Um, and this doesn't necessarily need to mean that, uh, you have some kind of technical expertise. Um, this could just be that you're incredibly organized or, um, you have a really easy way of connecting with people or whatever it may be. What is your specific unique skill set, and what, out of all of those ideas, which one do you think you can uniquely scale? Um, and then after you assess, let's say one or two of those ideas, you set up benchmarks for yourself. What does success look like for you? Is it signing a hundred customers in six months? Um, is it getting product fit? Um, whatever it may be. And then realistically checking in with yourself in six months, writing yourself a report card and saying, did I get an A plus? Did I fail? Uh, and if you failed, was it something where you could have controlled, meaning you could have done something differently? Um, or was it simply not a fit for the market? People didn't want to buy what you had to offer. Um, I think just yeah. taking a, oh, uh, yeah, I think just taking a kind of rational approach, at least in the beginning, um, is what would be helpful. Like this is what uh, myself and my co-founders did when we started our first company. Uh, and we failed multiple times before we started that specific company. Um, so, and that was an important learning that I learned through time. That's so there, there are a lot of things. So you're saying it could go either way. It does depend largely on the individual, whether or not they can be successful with that particular approach. Uh, the individual, the people they surround themselves with, uh, and what they find unique around their team that they could do better than other people in the market. I wouldn't worry too much about a, about a competitive market. Um, uh, it, it's kind of counter to, counterintuitive, but um, a lot of markets will naturally become competitive. It's called, uh, if there's an opportunity, many people will likely see that opportunity and likely want to go for it. Um, so what are you going to do differently if you have competitors? I think the best example of that right now is how so many people, um, small businesses especially, are pivoting into uh, customized face masks. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last question, and then we'll take some questions from the students. Um, finishing off, are there certain resources that you would like to share with students that will help them with mapping out um, their frameworks, their, their, their future plans, and their business goals, right? Because you spoke to that a little bit, Kevin, where you were saying um, you have to be honest with yourself and give yourself a six-month assessment and short-term, long-term, and kind of measure yourself against the goals that you've set for yourself. So what are some resources you think, maybe the top three or four resources 
that you think would help our students? Yeah, um, so it's actually funny because I'm taking this exact course right now. It's $12, <laughs> um, it's $12, it's on Udemy, uh, udemy.com. Um, I think it's called yeah, Introduction to Product Management. Um, yeah, sorry, it's called Become a Product Manager, Learn the Skills and Get the Job. Um, uh, it was 12 bucks uh, when I looked at it. Um, and it's a six week course. You learn all about this whole framework and how to you know, create your product. Um, that's one, um, but that's very technical and that's how to develop a business. But I think what I'm learning through time is um, how do you learn better empathy? How do you influence people? So it's an old book and maybe some here have read it. It's called How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. That was probably one of the most profound books I've ever read uh, and really kind of like now as a manager has really kind of reflect, I've reflected on that. Um, another good book is called The Outliers by Malcolm Gladwell. Um, it speaks about um, how uh, there are some things in life that you just cannot control. Um, there are some pre-existing factors uh, that, you know, they're out of your control and there's others that you can, where you can develop an expertise in a certain subject matter. Uh, and the lastly is, is probably something that the students here are reading. Um, it's the Odyssey. It's, 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 it's uh, Greek mythology. Um, really? The story that really resonated with me was actually a story of Icarus um, and how Icarus flew too close to the sun. Uh, and I don't want to ruin it, but uh, <laughs> that's kind of the, the sneak peek. Um, but I think what happens is at one point in all of our lives, we will feel like we are on top of the world. Um, and hubris or kind of uh, that overconfidence is oftentimes what shields us from different opportunities. So it's being rational, um, being tempered, of course, enjoying your success, uh, but always thinking ahead and staying humble. I think it's very important. Allison, because I, I, there's nothing more I can add to that. Allison. <laughs> <laughs> Actually very aligned with what everything Kevin just said. Um, it's interesting, I actually just took a project manage, intro to project management class on General Assembly. It's a free website, you can take a bunch of different classes. Um, and it's, you know, what it really teaches you is the having a framework and really building um, from the beginning to the end. And maybe you don't ever get to the end, but how do you keep evolving through this project? Um, and one of the other, uh, one of the resources they, they gave us in the class, it's a free site called Trello, T-R-E-L-L-O, and Trello.com, and you can go in there, it's free, you can kind of use it however works best for you and fits to you, um, but it's nice that there are resources out there, but I think from a project management point of view, um, a lot of companies are looking for sort of frameworks built around this, this idea. Um, all those books are really great too. And I have to say, I think just being humble, right? You're, you're going to have wins and fails and it's, um, there's always something more to be learned and learn from somebody else. So just staying humble and asking questions um, are just going to be really important in, in the journey and it doesn't end. You're always learning. Still taking classes. I'm still learning new things. And I hope that continues for a very long time. And I love the fact that you did that because that just, goes back to what we said in the very beginning about the fact that the lifelong love of learning, so it goes full circle, right? Lifelong love of learning is probably one of the most key mindsets to being successful in life because you can never know everything. Correct. And technology is always changing. <laughs> so, gotta keep up. That's a very true statement. I kind of remember how so much of the technology that's available today was not available um, at one point in my own life. Uh, so it's like, you're always learning because things are always changing. Um, I will open the floor for the students. Uh, if you have any questions, I know the last uh, discussion we had on Tuesday, there was someone who was asking about how to find money to start their business. So if ever there was a chance or a time to ask that question, it would be to somebody who provides money for businesses. And I'll be very honest, I can't see the chat. So if you're able to just uh, unmute yourself and um, ask a question.
So no questions. Um, in that case, Allison, you get the floor first. Uh, any last thoughts or insights that you would like to leave with our students today? Um, I just want to say you guys are in a very exciting program. Um, it's something I mentioned Daniel before and Taji that I wish I had this opportunity um, growing up because I honestly just hearing different perspectives and areas that you could possibly go into and maybe you don't start your own company but you take these skills into whatever your job may be into your career path and they're really important skill sets to have um, and you guys are super lucky that you can have it so young and really use this opportunity to help you as you get into college and move forward in your, in your career and your growth opportunities that are you know, ahead, coming ahead of you and you're making really great connections. Um, mentioned this the last time too, utilize LinkedIn. You're never too young to kind of start your own selling yourself and building this up and making these connections and asking questions. It's really important. So congratulations to all of you for, for being in this program. I will co-sign that because I always said, I wish that I was, uh, was in, um, a nifty program when I was in high school as well. So it's always a great opportunity. And last word, Kevin. Uh, no, I mean, echoing Allison, definitely you know, one. Uh, thank you all for being on here. Uh, the last piece of advice I would say is, is to Allison's point, the beauty of cold outreach. Um, you'd be surprised about the number of people that are willing to talk to you. Um, some quick advice on that. Um, just keep your cold outreach to about four sentences or so. So pretty short saying who you are, um, what you're interested in, and why you're interested in talking to that specific person. Um, I used to do this all the time, and I still do it, actually. I, do it, I probably just did it right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, there are many experts in the world, and LinkedIn and other platforms give you access to them, and just feel free to outreach people. Um, so that's it. Thanks, everyone, for your time. And thank you so very much. I am a huge and a firm um, proponent. I'm a huge proponent of um, networking and the power of networking, especially starting when you're younger. So um, definitely, definitely think that that's an important uh, thing to know about. Um, thank you so very much to all the students to join today. Um, have a absolutely amazing afternoon. Uh, Ms. Brown or um, Mr. Lawhorn, do you want them to return back to the classroom now or? Yes, my students should go back to their classroom. Absolutely. And furthermore, thank the guest speakers. You guys always have so much to offer uh, these young minds. And we really appreciate your time. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Kevin and Allison. This was, this was really great. You guys, this is a lot of, a lot of great insight. We appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for Y'all have you. a great afternoon. All right. Yeah. All right. Bye, everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye.